do the introduction and yep Hi, thank you for tuning in to the Howland SEL webinar series, our second session. This session is going to be about twice exceptional learners with Dr. Jude Sepero. She is an associate professor and the director of gifted education programs at the University of Nebraska Kearney. Dr. Sepero taught 20 plus years, primarily in middle school, but also three years in high school and one year in pre-K one. She's taught in private, charter, public, and public military-based schools, as well as homeschooled for a short amount of time. She completed her undergrad at Montclair State University in New Jersey, Nova Southeastern in Florida for her master's degree, and earned her PhD at Capella in Minnesota. She recently added coursework from the University of Colorado Denver in ABA. Dr. Sepharo's research interests include gifted learners, autism, choice exceptional, and advocacy. Her newest interest is investigating the potential application of ABA-based strategies to twice exceptional and gifted education. We are really lucky to have her here today to talk about twice exceptional learners, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over. Thank you, Cheyenne. Okay, well today we're going to be talking about twice exceptional learners. What does it mean to be a twice exceptional learner? What do parents of twice exceptional learners tell us? And then a little bit about the struggles that these students experience. And then we're going to have some strategies that we will share. So let's move on. Okay, the twice exceptional student. They're typically, um, they may have typical, typically more sophisticated language or perceptions or ideas, which seems to make them old beyond their years. They have, may have, and we can generalize about them, but they may have surprising insight. And as a result, they may seek out adults. Uh, when I was teaching in middle school, I found this to be very typical. One of the middle schools I taught in was a charter school and we had a large number of twice exceptional learners and just straight out gifted learners out of our 93 students. And they were very interested in interacting with the adults because sometimes their peers just didn't get them. So the nice thing about that particular school was there was such a large group that the interaction that students had with people like them, um, there was more opportunity for that, but they still sought out the adults, not, not seeking our approval, but just to get different ideas and bounce their ideas off of us. They also may have superior skills in some areas over other areas. So while they may have, just as an example, off the chart math skills, they may have some difficulties with reading or with comprehension. Their handwriting may not be very legible. Um, you know, and I know with the handwriting not being as often taught in schools, you know, even with computer skills, we have to make sure that they do their spell checking and things of that nature because what's going on in their brain may be going on so quickly, they just do a brain dump on the computer and then just are exhausted after that and forget to do the spell check. So we need for them to do that. Okay. School may not be their thing. So they're in school and they have to be in school by law, but it's just, there are times when they just don't feel like they're smart enough. And some of that may be as a result of their uh, frustration with some areas that are not really their strengths and it causes them to give up a little bit. Maybe it's organizational skills. Sometimes even the most um, intelligent person, if they're not organized, it, it looks like, well, do they even know what they're talking about? And of course they do, it's just that organizational skills are not their thing. They may lose interest in school. So we have to keep doing things to help them stay interested and to, to encourage their, their mindsets and their ability to think to think beyond what we may be even teaching them in school. Sometimes we don't realize they're gifted and that's the masking effect. We may see their other exceptionality or exceptionalities if they're multiply um, exceptional and, and that, may, that may cover the giftedness. So we may see the, uh, if you will, a deficit, I hate to use that phrase, but the area of struggle more so than the area that is gifted. So we have to make sure that we don't let the masking effect blind us to the child's giftedness. 
So what are parents telling us about their children? Well, I had the good fortune to conduct a study with my colleagues at UNK, uh, Dawn Mollenkoff, Bailey Irwin, and Jennifer Joy. And we, we were interested really in children before they started school. We wanted to know what parents found out about their kids. So we had this little study in mind and it was going to be strictly Nebraska focused, strictly parents um, reflecting back on their, their child um, when they were much younger before they started school. And we, were, we wanted to ask them when they realized their child was gifted. And we were specifically, specifically looking for parents of twice exceptional children. And what we found out was that parents recognized that their child was different beyond their years. And that, um, that had to do with the masking effect. They, they knew through the APGAR scores and you know many states, if not all states, used Dr. APGAR, Dr. Virginia APGAR from a New York Presbyterian Hospital scoring technique, which is when they look at the child, when the child is first born, they look at appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiration. I have to check my notes on that all the time because I don't want to mislead you with the information. And um, they give a score in each of those areas of zero to two with all five areas possibly adding up to 10. And what they check with those children is for red flags. If there's something not quite as it should be according to the APGAR scores. I can tell you from my own experience with my own son who was not gifted, but he does have autism. When the APGAR scores were taken and we were immediately told there was a deficit, I think he scored six or seven if I remember correctly. And so we knew there was a deficit and um, immediately, you know, the state became involved and they offered all kinds of services for him, even from the time he was very, very little. Now, interestingly enough with him, when he was about two years old, he, I happened to hear him playing in his bedroom. He was just sitting up with his duplos and he was doing, just playing with them. And numbers always seemed to fascinate him, even when he was very small. And he was sitting there and he was two, two, four, you know, three, three, nine, and he was seeing his multiplication tables and it was like, what is going on here? So he is not gifted, let me just say that, but math is his thing. So we found that that was an area of his strength and, um, and we worked with that. So he was able to, to work on different math than kids in the group he was in, in his preschool and school years because he did like math and he did see numbers as colors and he did see numbers in, in various shapes. So that was a skill that he happened to have. Now, with had he been gifted, then that would have been a for something for us to really take a look at and say, okay, well, maybe he's starting, you know, he's beyond multiplication and addition and subtraction. So how are we going to really keep his interest going? What other things can we offer him? And those parents of gifted children when they realized that their child had, had these gifts, they were scampering. They were looking for other things to keep the child interested because it wasn't just the exception, the other exceptionality they were dealing with. Now they had the exceptionality of giftedness to work with. So now they were balancing. And sometimes we had parents who had multi-exceptional children and that was a whole other, other bag. One of the things that the parents did tell us was they felt like there was limited training and that more support needed to be provided for these kids, even right off the bat. And as I said, when my son was identified very early on, we received services in um, physical therapy, occupational therapy through the state immediately upon his birth. And if a child is gifted, they don't know that. So they can't start providing those services immediately. So it would be just amazing if we could get something set up for those kids early on and, and discover this very quickly about them. So let's talk a little bit about this survey. So it was a little survey. It was started out to be a little survey. Um, the study background, we had 249 people open the survey. Now, just because they opened the survey didn't mean they took the survey. Now that's that's a, something for us, my research team to look at because maybe the survey was too big, it was too complicated, it took too much time. So you never want a survey that's gonna make people turn away. But we did have 177 people take the complete survey, which is 71%, so we were pretty happy about that. 
The interesting thing is I presented this survey at the 2014 NAG conference in Omaha at a parent meeting and parents seemed very interested. As I said at the beginning, we were interested in Nebraska, but then it so happened that Hoagie's gifted education page learned about the survey and offered to put the survey out there and who was I to say no? So we put the survey out there with, with Hoagie's and they put it on their their main page, they put it on their Facebook page. NAG, which was wonderful, they put their the survey on their Facebook page and their NAG newsletter. And then somehow the International Gifted um, Organization found it, probably through Hoagies, I'm guessing, and they put it on their Facebook page. Then all of a sudden LinkedIn got it. And we, I, we were receiving notes uh, from our LinkedIn accounts, people asking to take the survey. And then word of mouth. And then interestingly enough, we were getting emails about the survey and would you open up the survey? So it was open for about a year. We wound up with um, 37 states participating three to five countries. And that was kind of interesting too, because we didn't expect it to go that far. And as I said, it was open for about a year. I did go to a conference a year ago this past July in Nashville for the World Gifted Conference. And um, I went into a presentation and it was parents talking about their children, they were from Australia and talking about gifted when they realized their children were gifted. And after their presentation, which was really wonderful, I went up and I said, I introduced myself and I said, I'm so interested in what you're doing. It's it's great. And, and one of the women said, I took your survey. So that was kind of fun because it was, we were able to make a connection there. So we exchanged information. We had a nine questions focused strictly on family and it was two sections and 13 questions focused on school experiences from the parent point of view. So we didn't get teachers involved in this one. That's room for another survey, but uh, we did get the parents, we wanted the parent perspective for this survey. So let's talk about the identification process. And we have this nice little chart there for you. And um, we, we wanted to know when the child was served. And we found that um, children were generally identified, they were tested in early elementary K-1. So that was, that was good. We were happy about that. So they were young. But we also found that the parents realized their children were gifted or beyond the typical um, three to five years earlier than the schools. Now, this is not a negative to the schools because schools don't generally see kids that young. So you know, it's important to listen to what parents are saying because they're seeing this very early on and they're, and what we found is they're very willing to talk to you because we're working with some case studies now with parents who wanted to talk more about their experiences. So parents are interested in sharing information. So please listen to what they have to say. Um, the referral process can sometimes take long and that, that kind of frustrated parents because the first exceptionality or the more obvious exceptionality was being identified and addressed. And, and they felt that, what about their gifted exceptionality? What about meeting that need? So we can't forget one without addressing the other. So they felt that also, they felt that the schools didn't offer quite enough training. And Cheyenne and I have talked about having a gifted education intro to gifted for um, undergrads. And that might be a really good idea to get them involved with gifted education earlier in their teaching experience. And yep, next slide. Okay, and then we have just some of the exceptionalities identified. Now we have um, some of these people identified more than one exceptionality. They would identify gifted, but in the other realm, it was not just, for example, say autism, but maybe another exceptionality like behavior hooked on with that. So what we found out was we had thrice and multi exceptionalities going on here and parents were very, very willing to address that. So we can't, I guess we can't just limit them or generalize and say twice exceptional. Now we have to look at the bigger picture of the multi exceptional child. Okay, gifted versus, oh, the who referred, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. So who referred? Well, parents. That's who referred. The parents are the children's biggest advocate. 
they are the first ones to go in there and say to you, yes, my child, I believe there's something else going on here. You've got to look beyond the other exceptionality. So we found that parents were really becoming very strong advocates. They were seeing, they were seeing the big picture of the child, not just one facet of the child, but the whole child. So we, once again, we really need to listen to what parents are telling us. And when they refer to their child as being gifted, we just need to listen to them. I know sometimes, I know as a teacher, I could tell you that I felt at some point, everyone wanted their child in gifted education. It was an elitist thing. Let's get our child tested. And then when you had to say, well, you know, they didn't, they didn't make it well, you know, so what, what, it, what is the time that it takes to just test the child? I know sometimes schools don't like to spread their resources too thin, but if a parent is seeing something, maybe we need to pay, take, a, take a look at it and pay attention to what they're trying to tell us. All right, so gifted versus special education. And you can see how the services compare. Um, they felt that the gifted education supports were not as good. Now, this is not a slight on teachers. Teachers are doing all they can. Even school districts are doing what they can. But in the case of twice exceptional children, this is, this is something that has not always been addressed. It's always been you're in one bucket or the other bucket. So now we have a blending of the buckets and what do we do? So that's why teacher education in, in the field of teacher education, it's so important to introduce teachers to the concept of multi-exceptional children, to introduce them to gifted education because not every school or every, um, every program addresses gifted education. I know back in New Jersey, gifted education was part of special education. It was all encompassing, but when, when I moved to Florida, gifted education was separate and I had to go back to school for gifted education and learn more. And you know what, that was a good thing because one of the schools I was in, I, in Florida, predominantly gifted education kids. And so having that refresher and that focus on gifted education really was very beneficial to me. So this, this um, particular graph, you know, it's a little like, mm, wow, what are we doing wrong? But that's not the way to look at it. The, the way to look at it is what can we do to make ourselves even better? Okay, so our plans for future research, as I mentioned, is to talk to more parents and do some case studies and find out what their story is. Um, you know, it would be probably interesting as the kids get older to talk to them and get their perspective because that would be a really great perspective to have and then develop more, um, more strategies for advocacy for parents and schools to work together and to have an open dialogue and then to get a deeper understanding of twice exceptional and multi exceptional children. Once again, their perspective would be an amazing thing to have if they're willing to share with us. All right, the struggle is real. One thing that we can do, um, according to Azzalini et al, is to look at school records. And I know with the situation in the world now, going into an enclosed room with a bunch of records that maybe people have been pawning over for a while is a bit scary. And I'll be honest with you, I had in my last school, which was Orange County Public Schools, we had, I had 160 plus special education identified children and 60 plus gifted identified children. And then the blend of twice exceptional and multi exceptional just, you know, existed between those two groups. But going into those files and sitting there for days, it felt like to get information, it can be overwhelming. But we need to review those records and it may take a while. And I know if you're teaching, you have to fit that into your day and that's difficult. And, you know, in some cases, if you're fortunate enough to have a support facilitator who does have the, op the ability to go in there and review records and give insight to the professional learning communities, that's, that's wonderful if you can have that. But the records are so important. But remember, sometimes with records, words are written down and you don't know the real perspective of the person who wrote them. So talk to the parents, get their insight, find out what they know. 
you know, we write things down. I, I, we could look back at our own report cards and teachers may have written things down like, you know, needs to speak up more in class. And then you're a teacher and you're talking all the time. So what does that mean back when you were in first grade, not talking? You know, we have to look at what's being written because it's written in the moment and it's written from a perspective, a very small period of time. I know a school year seems like longer, but it's a small period of time in the child's life. So we need to get a bigger perspective about that. Um, it's a team effort. So you need to get in touch with the professional learning community that you work with. We need to have um, the student involved, the child involved. Why not get them involved? Let them become used to speaking with the school guidance counselor and the school psychologist and, and the school administration. Let them get used to meeting with those people so they know what these teams do and how those teams support them. It's not uh, them against us type mentality. We're working for the, for the greater good of the child. And then we have to develop a plan for the child an education plan. Now, many of these kids will have IEPs, some of them will have EPs, and those parents have to come to those meetings. And it's important for the parents to be aware of what's going on in those meetings and involve those parents in the meetings to let them know that, that we're trying to work with the child. Have the child involved with the meeting. One of the, the best things I did was to work with my, my students, my twice exceptional students particularly, on self-advocacy skills and help them prepare for meetings so that they can go in and maybe learn to talk for themselves and self-advocate. And also help the parents out a little bit because sometimes parents draw strengths from their children and vice versa. So it would be great to have them all in there together working with us to help their children. Okay, let's talk more about the counselors. So many of our, our folks in guidance and in, in school psychology don't necessarily have a lot of background in gifted education or working with twice or multi-exceptional children. So we need to help them learn this information and, and share with them what we know and to have them meet the children, have them learn the background of the children. They may not go into the CUME file as deeply as you will. So as far, part of your professional learning community, get them involved, get them working with you so they can see the big picture. Invite them to that professional learning community meeting and, and, and get them to, to look at those records and provide some insight. They may be sharing something that you hadn't expected. We need the guidance counselors to work with communicating with the parents and guardians, not just showing up and, and sharing the, the data that they've taken, but really sharing information that can help the child and help the parent and can help the teachers all work together and, and build a plan for the child that will benefit them through their school years. It's also important to develop a relationship of, um, with the child so that they know who you are, not just walking into the classroom and sitting in the back and taking the data, but actually getting to know the person. You, the child can't just be data. They are living, breathing human beings that deserve that, that recognition and acknowledgement and the opportunity to, for you to build a relationship with them so they can trust you and, and they can continue working with you because what you write and what you find out about them, you may find things that they don't even realize about themselves and how amazing that would be for that information to go with them and for them to understand that information so that they can continue to build upon their strengths and their parents can support them and their teachers can support them. Okay, behavior, let's talk a little, oh, we're not going to do that one right now. <laughs> behavior, let's talk about that. So your twice exceptional child may or student may display behaviors that maybe, you know, are not especially what you would prefer that they, they display. And we need to know the, the function of that behavior. Why are they avoiding? Why are they trying to escape? Why are they doing what they're doing? Maybe they can't explain that to us. So it's a really good idea to maybe do a behavior assessment, identify the function of that behavior, and discuss it with the child if possible, and, and let them know you understand their struggle, and try to build a plan about 
on based on the behavior, how that behavior can improve. So for example, one of the things you could do is maybe the child is avoiding. So maybe build a choice board for them. Maybe use tic-tac-toe. If the behavior is such that they don't want to work on something, but they need to, maybe build an if-then. If you complete this, then you can do that. And we also need to remember that not all of these children are STEM or STEAM focused. That that's a great, that's a great thing if they are. Kudos to them. But it's not for everyone. Some kids may just want a book. And there's nothing wrong with that. They may like the feel of the pages between their fingers. It's a tactile thing. Let them have it. Let them enjoy that. If computers are other things, great. Let them have that. But not every kid will accept uh, the, the computer or the iPad as a reward. To some, that may not be rewarding. So we have to look at all of their preferences. And that's where we can do a preference assessment. And taking a preference assessment is can be a, such a fun thing you learn more about the child, they learn more about themselves. But the thing with taking a preference assessment is you have to remember that just because something is preferred now doesn't mean it's always going to be preferred. So we have to make sure we, we check in on that occasionally and make changes. Then we need to build on their strengths. It's not a one size fits all type program. Gifted, I mean, they talk about autism being a spectrum. Well, isn't gifted also kind of a spectrum? I mean, it's a very broad spectrum, especially when you talk about multi-exceptional children. So we need to take a look at what we're expecting from them. So one of the things that we can do is we can help them maybe overcome fears or, you know, we all dread the unknown. We don't like when we, things when we don't understand what's happening. So one of the things we can do, and I did this with my own students, is I built social stories for them. So, and they participated in building those social stories. So it could be voiced, it could be animated, it could, it could be anything you want it to be. But it's a great thing, especially I found during EP and IEP meetings, we would build social stories together and then they would anticipate what was going to happen at these meetings. And then they would, I'd say, take it home to your parents, share it with them. Because sometimes when parents are experiencing IEP meetings for the first time, it's overwhelming. Uh, being on that side of the table, even though I was a teacher, I would go into my son's IEP meeting and all these people were sitting there and it was just me. And I felt like Daniel going into the lion's den sometimes because I, you, know, you didn't know what was gonna happen. They didn't give you a, really an agenda. So you, know, you need to, help the parents understand that the last school I was in, we had parents avoiding these meetings, I can't tell you. And it was difficult for them. In, in the case of my, my last school, uh, second language was, was one of the components that caused them to avoid the meetings. And so the nice thing is with social stories, you can translate them. You can have the story translated. And that would be great because you want the child, if English is not their first language, to keep building on their second language and then share it with the parents. So that way, when they come into the meeting, it's not a surprise and it's a friendly, warm environment. It shouldn't be like going into a board meeting. It should really be a welcoming situation. So that way we can work with them and let them understand, hey, we're on your side. We're on this kid's side. We want this child to succeed because that child may do amazing things with their life. I know my own experience with students, I have some that are, one that is particular, he's doing up, finishing up his terminal degree at Johns Hopkins now. Another one was a city planner for, I don't know, where in California. And another one works for PBS. And, and that's just a couple of them. And they've done amazing things. And I remember when they were in school, one of their activities is, you know, they wanted to build a hoverboard as one of their science activities. So they did. They worked on a hoverboard and they got to do that. And there's nothing wrong with, with building on those strengths and helping them learn differently because they are different learners and they do experience things differently. And we want them to understand that they're, they're not strange because of that. They're, they're, they just learn differently and they have different gifts to share. We also um, could curriculum compact for them. 
um, I worked with two of my former students and advisees, and we presented together at the NAG conference two years ago. We also presented in Nashville at the, at the World Gifted Conference, and they presented on curriculum compacting and how to, um, and, and you've all been exposed to curriculum compacting, but they actually brought in examples from their own children, from their own students. Another thing we did was I, I always teach my students about tiering and it's the core, which is what you would expect everyone to learn, but then the core plus more supports for your struggling learners and then even more supports at tier three for those who really struggle. Well, from the gifted side, it could be the core plus more latitude or more enrichment. And then for tier three, the core plus even more enrichment and more latitude. And the beauty of the tiered lesson plan is you could start to think about, well, if the child finishes up what I've expected them to do, what can I build in there? And share it with the child, let them know about it so that they can, you know, they can build on, on what they're learning and, and just explore different, different things. Let's see what else do we have um cornell notes are a great organizational tool i don't know if any of you have ever used that but it uh, it they are both electronic or they can be just regular pen and paper cornell notes but it allows the child to think about what they are learning help with the metacognition skills and think about what they're learning and then maybe jot down their questions so if you've got a kid that blurts out maybe you can show them how to use the cornell notes to put their questions so that when it, the appropriate time comes, they could then ask their questions. And it helps break down learning to make it more logical for the child. One of the things that I worked with my students on was Possible Selves, which is a strategy from SIM, the Strategic Instruction Model out of KUCRL. And we use content enhancement, which I, I hesitate to use the word graphic organizers because that's not what they are, but some people might use that phrase, but they are uh, an organizational tool to help with figuring out how you're learning information. But back to possible selves, possible selves is a way for the child to get to know themselves and reflect on who they are and what they want to be. And I worked with kids with possible selves to help them prepare for self-advocacy for their IEP slash EP meetings. And we practice this and um, my own students at UNK, some of them are, will be working with this, um, this semester with me. And um, it was just a beautiful thing to see these kids go into their meetings and, and share what they knew about themselves and how to and conduct themselves in such a, um, I don't wanna say professional matter, but with a level of self-assurance that they would not have had if they did not have possible selves with the combination of the social story to help them go into those meetings and just, just share what they knew and what they wanted for themselves and share their perspective and their ideas. And, you know, parents would sit there in amazement at their own kid, but they would, you know, they would be more willing and more comfortable chiming in when they saw their child just being who they really were at these meetings. Also praise, it needs to be specific. Telling someone good job is never enough. We need to say, you did a great job on this and I like this or this in particular was great. So we need to tell them what they did really well, not just the generalization, good job. On the other side, if something isn't quite right, we can't say, oh, do that again. Well, why? Why do I have to do that again? Tell me what I did wrong. We all know as adults, when someone tells us we didn't do a good job on something, the first question is, well, what was wrong with it? We want to know how we can do better. I mean, that's just human nature, isn't it? We want the kids to have that opportunity too. Okay, continue on. So differentiation, I talked a little bit about tiered lesson plans and how important they can be for our students. And delving into that with curriculum compacting is a great, great tool, not only to help you be organized, but to help you when those kids come and say, well, I've done this already. So one of the other things we can look at is maybe teaching the most difficult thing first. If someone knows the material and can score 80 to 85%, 
why do they have to do the rote material? Why do they have to do the rote generalization and, and memorization and all that kind of stuff? Why not let them continue on? One of the things that we found at one of the schools I taught in was we would have the students look at, we would look at their skills and then they would come in and they would, they would have the opportunity to break out into different groups and try to do different things. And that is a great opportunity for these kids because we want them to be able to, you know, explore different opportunities. Next slide, please. Okay, individual subject acceleration. At one of the schools I taught in, it was a charter school where we had quite a lot of gifted kids. We did individual subject acceleration and we worked with Florida Virtual School. Now this was back in uh, 2002, so it was quite a long time ago. And I'm sure they're doing leaps and bounds above that now. But one of the things we would do is for it, in the area of math, for example, a student would score very highly in the middle school grades math program. Well, why should they have to sit in the room and redo that over and over again? You're going to lose them. So what we did was we worked with Florida Virtual Schools and we had our big old clunky um, desktop computers all around the room. And when the kids came in, if a student was beyond what was being taught in the classroom at that time, they would work with Florida Virtual School and they would start doing high school level work be it algebra, trigonometry, geometry, whatever it was. And they would work with the Florida virtual school teacher while the teacher conducted class with the core or the, the students who were learning typical middle school math. And then those students who were accelerated in the subject would work on the computer and they would work on whatever math they were, were signed up to work on based on their skill level. The beauty of this is as the teacher would break the typical or the core group into whatever groups they needed to be working in. Then the, the teacher would then go to the, to the students working with Florida Virtual School and check in with them. So those students had such great benefits because not only did they have a teacher at Florida Virtual School working with them, but they had their own classroom teacher checking in on them and they were still with their peers. So they didn't get pulled out of the room. They were still in the room and they could still do some activities with their peers if they finished their work or whatever. So that was a great opportunity for those students. And we did it with every subject area. So it was really nice for those kids to have that opportunity. Another thing um, to, we did at that school in particular was portfolios. Not everyone needs to prove what they've learned something because they took a test. Maybe there's other ways they could show that they know their skills. Maybe they could work on a portfolio or they could do a project and, and then prove that they've learned the material based on a project. I used, as a his, former history teacher, I used to like to do that with my students. But one thing I learned with them is get them involved with the rubric. Because sometimes they would come to me and they'd say, well, I did this project and, and they'd present it in front of everyone and they did a great job. And then they would say to me, well, you know, you missed something. You didn't see, the, what about this? I did this, how did you miss that? And they would call me out on it and I deserve to be called out on it. So what I learned from them is help them work on the rubric because they sometimes come up with ideas that I never thought of and they were great ideas. and. And it just made the presentation or the sharing of the work so much richer because of their active participation in it. Okay, so there are the questions and I've included some resources for you. I talked about um, social stories and I've included Carol Gray's information on there and quite a lot of other information. So please take the time to look at that and enjoy it and use it as you will. Thank you so much for joining me today and giving me this opportunity to talk with you about twice exceptional learners. Thank you, Dr. Sepharo, for presenting, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Me too. Thank you.